Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our podcast today. We have returning guest and uh, a maven in the uh, information realm of this movement, the Patriot Movement, S.G. Anon, is joining us for his second go-around and what we anticipate to be many more. And if you are, again, new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and share. S.G., thank you for joining us back on the podcast. Thank you for having me back. Good to be here. Oh, it's an honor. So there, as always, SG, there's so many places that we can take this. From the last time we spoke, uh, I believe it was early last month, so many things obviously have transpired and transacted. Um, let's start a little bit on the <clears throat> your area of expertise, the geopolitical front, with respect to uh, what's going on with some of the supply chain issues, Iran being inflamed in the Red Sea, Strait of Hormuz. I believe that one of the U.S. drones was shot down either today or yesterday. So we can see the, the flames are being fanned in that respective region of the world. And I think that's obviously by design because they need as many distractions as possible. What do, you, what do you see happening now? And how do you see this thing playing out over the next, let's say, 60 days? Well, what we've got happening right now in that area, and I appreciate you starting with this because it's really important and it's going to come back to U.S. energy markets in a very significant way. What we've got in that area is a disconnection of worldwide shipping lanes from this idea of maritime safety. Um, you've got a disempowerment of major, major choke points of worldwide uh, supply, commodities, goods, et cetera, that go through these areas, right? The, the, the Suez Canal, of course, being at the tip of the Red Sea, that's a very significant transit pathway to the most of the rest of the world. The Strait of Hormuz responsible for more than 20% of the world's liquefied natural gas, petroleum, crude oil, et cetera, that comes through there. Um, and this all coincides right against the backdrop of an Iraqi government uh, financial reset, which has been authorized and, and essentially given the go-ahead within Iraq uh, as of January 1 of this year. And so we're witnessing the literal choking out of the petrodollar, but we're also witnessing uh, a strangulation hold that has been on the supply chains of the world for a long time is now being released. Um, you know, in, in prior days past, you were not able to, um, you know, board these vessels or stop commerce or anything of that nature. There was no lawful justification, no rational reason for the public face to go in and perform any sort of good work, right? Everything was sort of under the laws of the seas. And if you attempted to do so, regardless of your intentions, you were cast as a pirate. So the same is true in this situation, except now we've created a wartime condition, a public facing narrative control situation. We're also going in, we're interrupting major levels of commerce, major shipments of fuel and oil. Um, not that long ago, we saw coinciding, you know, two days, I think, prior to the, the Yemeni um, attacks on the, the most recent attacks on the Red Sea. We saw this massive flooding in Latakia, Syria that took out an oil depot. So this is a, a targeted, I think, operation to stress worldwide energy and finance markets and set the camel up, if you will, for that final straw hit. And I think that final straw, quite frankly, John, is going to come from China. I think that's going to come from the Pacific region. And I think the stress on world commerce markets, uh, coupled with the complete shutting down of Pacific shipping lanes in that South China Sea area, uh, which transits, of course, down south and, and um, west from that area through the Indonesian uh, archipelago and into the Indian Ocean, you're going to see that entire strip is suddenly, um, I think, is going to be declared a no-go zone by the Chinese Coast Guard. And so the, the paralysis of worldwide shipping translates um, in literal dollars, if we want to use the terminology, to the paralysis of the financial and retail spaces in the West, in North America and Western Europe, etc. So this, and, and the and again, the backdrop of doing this against the drop of the petrodollar means that you're going to also be strangulating the the backfall, uh, the bulwark, the the backdrop, if you will, that su is supposed to prevent, excuse me, the collapse of these particular uh, institutions that we're talking about. So this movement, you know, is a coordinated, I think, military civilian sort of alliance type movement where you have uh, businesses that have positioned themselves to absorb heavy losses. Uh, you have militaries around the world conducting exercises that are clearly affecting massive shipping lanes, um, even publicly now. Um, just recently, I saw a, an over 60 percent um, or excuse me, an over 60 cents uh, spike in the price per gallon for gasoline, what, what the Europeans would call petrol in my area. Uh, so this coincides very nicely with the events that we would expect to happen, right? Because there's always sort of a drip down. There's always sort of a time delay with, between these events happening geopolitically around the rest of the world and then moving themselves back to the North American you know, markets and homeland and bringing themselves to roost in Eastern Europe or excuse me, in Western Europe. 
So you asked me my prediction for the next 60 days. I, I, I see this powder keg getting much more lit up, um, possibly even including some sort of action from China. We really don't know. Um, China has been sort of silently in this operation uh, for the reclamation of Taiwan since late 2022. And whenever that you know operation goes public and overt is anybody's guess. But I would assume that in that um, fanning of the flames, you're going to see significant economic downturn events or significant stressor events on manufacturing and commerce that are going to make themselves known to the mass public. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you brought up many salient points, but two that really struck me is about Iraq's reset, because that's obviously something on our channel we key on in, as you know, quite a bit. Uh, you know, there's the, that's why I was asking about the distractions, because I believe that they're going to use as many of those false fronts to get all those bills pushed into parliament with Sudani, get the reforms. You know, you have Macron and you have uh, Erdogan, which I believe, if you translate his name, means Red Dragon, ironically, uh, coming into uh, the area of Iraq to sign off on the HCL gas law. And also to your point about China, uh, we reported last week, amongst others, that their CSI 1000 index, they've lost almost 30% of the value, which is devastating for any country, especially of China's population status. So we have that front going on. Then we have the other <laughs> sort of unmentionable but needs to be brought out, the elephant in the room, uh, Israel, right? Because we believe they're going to make a grave mistake with respect to Iran's secret nuclear power plants. You and I touched on that last month. But as a reprise, I believe some of their ships are on fire today. You had some drone attacks. What do you see with Israel's role uh, in all of this on the backs of that and, and how precipitously or how quick do you, do you see them kind of getting involved in this conflict? You know, as it pertains to the broader struggle in the Middle East, I think that they're already involved. We've got the Israeli Air Force that's hitting Syria. The Israeli Air Force just today hit Lebanon openly. Um, Hezbollah declared war a couple of weeks back, and so they've been, you know, amassing assets down in the south of Lebanon. It's one of the reasons that the Israeli airstrikes, that, that these strikes just occurred. Um, I think is, Israel's role is twofold in this, quite frankly. I think Israel's role from a, if we were to say a philosophical standpoint, if we were to take it from more of an esoteric lesson for humanity, it is that government and people are very separate uh, in today's day and time, and they're not supposed to be. The Israeli we, the people, are you know amongst the most terrorized individuals in the world. If you look at the fact that they had individuals turning, or they had, excuse me, law enforcement turning away individuals trying to buy literal food for their families because they didn't have a card that showed that a, an experimental drug had been injected into their skin. But at the same time, the Israeli deep state government is heavily controlled and influenced by the Israeli Mossad, which is the same sort of setup, the same sort of shadow backdrop that all of the NATO Western models also follow, the CIA, MI6, uh, the special services, Canadian intelligence, things like that. So Israel's role from a militarized standpoint would be a governmental or a deep state role, right? What is the role now being played by the Israeli deep state government? Um, that, that role, I think, is self-protection and self-preservation at all costs. But ir ironically, you're seeing uh, the actions being taken by the Likud government, uh, specifically Netanyahu, who I believe capitulated to Trump uh, in 2017, that are antagonizing the entire region, right? They're antagonizing very, very old uh, 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 faith-based wounds, quite frankly, very, very old cultural uh, dogmas that have taken themselves you know, with a strong root in that area of the world. And so what we've got is we have the Netanyahu government's decision making that seems to be slow walking the entire Israeli government, uh, the Knesset, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, all of the functioning institutions that govern that territory. It seems to be slow walking them towards some sort of absolution. The absolution, I believe, is going to come uh, on behalf of Turkey. I think you're going to see a multifold Arab coalition that will very quickly, and, and I'm, I mean in a matter of hours or just a couple of days, will roll through um, the desert countrysides in that area of the world and will roll themselves into the Israeli um, um, you know, nation state. I don't think that the IDF, um, while, while admirable and their fighters are, are well trained, I don't believe that they're going to be able to handle a multi-pronged coalition in a shock and awe campaign style format. And remember, the U.S. Army and, and ostensibly the NATO support all of that right now is coming primarily from um, naval and air-based assets. They don't have a lot of troops. There are some troops on the ground, but they don't have a lot of troops on the ground, certainly not in any capacity to repel a standing army. 
Um, most of the United States Army is in Eastern Europe, and it's not modernized for this sort of uh, rapid transition into active duty, you know, frontline combat. Um, the NATO militaries are so choked for ammunition, fuel, uh, things of that nature due to the actions of many of their governmental actors that they're also not able to field much kinetic support. As a matter of fact, they're looking to save face because it's not been that long ago that Britain uh, said they were going to deploy one of their largest aircraft carriers and then, and then at the last minute backed out for a propeller issue, um, which, you know, if, if you're experienced in uh, making things up, that doesn't really sound uh, very feasible considering that the amount of preparation and the amount of inspection that would occur to a vessel like that for a number of months prior to its departure um, there's no way that that was missed until the last minute, right? So we're looking at the the Western powers that military intelligence uh, block, which is, and I say military intelligence because, or excuse me, let me rephrase, intelligence community block. Let's separate that out from military intelligence. The intelligence community block of nations, the Five Eyes, the Mossad, the CIA, et cetera, are not positioned in a way to stop a shock and awe campaign of a standing army in that area of the world. But Russia is positioned to not only assist with that, but to actually benefit from that. Just recently, we had a number of uh, individuals from a um, uh, the Palestinian um, Gaza territory that were invited to Moscow to participate in discussions with the Kremlin. Um, the Iranians, while not necessarily you know, taking the same viewpoint of Islam itself and of the world itself as some of the other factions of the Sunni Muslim world do, all of the Muslims sort of believe themselves to be brothers in arms in the same fashion that the Slav, uh, the Slavic community in Eastern Europe sees themselves to be ancestrally, you know, basically brothers. And, and the same is true of the melting pot of the United States, just in a different format. So where this goes from here, I think, is is the complete disempowerment of the Israeli deep state. There's a number of things that'll, that will be exposed, I believe, by going into Israel as an Arab coalition. One, I think you're actually going to see protection offered to a great deal of the We the People citizenry in that area. I don't think that you're going to see a bloodthirsty coalition that seeks to you know, carry out eye for an eye revenge. And the reason I say that is because of what was done with the Abraham Accords um, and the, the peace deal that was negotiated by Trump to prevent such an action from arising in the future. Um, I think you're going to see the disempowerment of the Israeli deep state government. I think you're going to, and that's going to be very public. I think you're going to see the involvement of the Israeli Mossad in manipulations of nations around the rest of the world to include the United States of America. I think you're also going to see a number of uh, financial nexuses that go through the Israeli countryside, specifically into and out of Jerusalem, that are going to be shown out to be, you know, the Panama Papers on steroids, very, very large money laundering and hideaway holes. Um, you know, the, it was actually out of Israel that a, a um, war game was ran, simulating a cyber attack that collapsed the entire SWIFT financial system in the West, which Israel, of course, is a part of. So I think that, you know, what role Israel has to play, John, that's such a tall question. They, they have a role to play in awakening the, the, the consciousness to the layers of infiltration and how that, how that actually works. They have a role to play to show what brainwashing and, and total media control can do to a population and, and specifically that population's perceptions and perspectives about the rest of the world. Um, they're going to showcase out the, the intelligence community and their involvement in the manipulations of the finer actions of all governments, especially here in the United States. Um, there's a lot of different biological terrorism. There's over 40 biological laboratories in the Israeli countryside. This is one of the smaller nations in, in the world, and they have a concentration of bio labs to rival that of Ukraine, which is several million square kilometers. So to look at this and, and to see this fleshed out um, and, and how this may plan, you know, pan itself out, I think that a number of things are going to come as a result of what Israel is, of the actions that Israel is taking right now. And again, just to close this segment off, they seem to be doing at a governmental level the exact opposite that the intelligence community, which would prefer to remain in the shadows unannounced and, and sort of unremarked, um, is not in agreement with. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, it's that's a really beautifully <clears throat> drawn out overview of of what's going on there. It is, and it is a tall order. You're right because there's just so many aspects at play. It's like subdivisions or subfiles within the roles of their responsibility. Let's uh, do a <clears throat> excuse me a two part question here, SG. Uh, just drawing back to your your first point about uh, sort of the manufactured oil crisis. Uh, we know that when that tipping point happens, uh, it's going to spike oil up exponentially for a time. The first question is, when do you see that 
you know, happening and what do you see the potentiality of that rate being at its, <clears throat> at its zenith? And then the second part is, you know, you see a lot of <clears throat> things going on back here stateside. You have truckers uh, refusing to now bring goods and services into New York City, I believe, as of today. As you rightly pointed out, SG, and I was going to say that as President Trump had already pre-orchestrated, you know, peace deals that he's now going to, you know, trot out in front of the public for public consumption to see. Uh, you have bank failures happening. I mean, branches going, you know, haywire uh, and going out of business. You have Nike that laid off 2% of their workforce starting last week. So how do you see the oil part? And then how do you see that coinciding with what happens over here stateside? Well, you know, let me start the segment by first saying that I'm not a financial or strategic advisor, but these events, I think, have to move themselves in a direction that is hyperinflationary to some degree, simply because of the amount of fiat currency that is out there and the the disproportionate uh, supply versus demand situation that exists and has existed for a long time. But when you're strong arming every nation on earth, either militarily or uh, economically, right, you can create artificial demand where there where there's you know far excess supply to demand and you can manipulate the other side of the equation that's no longer true and it's and it's being proven itself out um, as one nation after another after another ditches the US dollar in trade as a matter of fact Egypt just today ditched the US dollar Cairo will no longer participate in trade with the currencies that are manipulatable at that degree right and the US dollar as much as we would like to believe it has been a bulwark of a strength and liberty and a beacon of freedom in a sense of what economic achievement can be that that imagery that that uh, casting right of the dollar itself is, has not been truly accurate in about 100 years right 1913 to this period of time just over 110 years so how this plays into the oil which is the question i wanted to i wanted to set that context up because it's so important the oil is the only thing remaining the oil is the last step to really cutting the throat of the U.S. serpent dollar, dropping that constrictor out of the world, you know, dealing that blow to, to financial markets in the West, which will cause not only a public mass awakening, but also the need for action to be taken by patriotic actors, uh, both at the community level, I believe, and at that policy level, at that governmental level. We have to codify um, a better way of doing things as we move forward or two generations from now, some jerk with a, you know, a clever uh, ledger book is going to attempt this scheme all over again. So in this particular process, the oil is coming. And I think we're actually into that period. Now I talked about that jump and spike or that spike in price um, uh, near me just within the last 72 hours. We're seeing reports of that all over the United States of America right now. Um, you know, again, I'm not a strategic advisor or market analyst, but I would say that, you know, anywhere from 150, maybe $170 a barrel, I don't think would be out of the realm of possibility, given the nature of the type of constriction that's now happening in the main area of the world for oil, uh, petrol, national, you know, liquefied natural gas uh, movement and transfer, right? This is this, the Middle East accounts for a tremendous amount and the OPEC nations themselves um, account for a very vast amount, nearly all of the major worldwide trade that's conducted in the oil and gas markets, right? The fuel markets, um, and, and so that ties into you know all of this U.S. dollar situation. And what I find very interesting is a number of those very large oil producing giant nations, such as Venezuela, Iran, um, and others, were heavily involved in cyber cyber interference with the U.S. 2016, 18, and 2020 elections. And in 2020, we even had Iran called out specifically. Um, and targeted by EO 13848 two years after President Trump's issuance for exactly that criminal activity. Um, that amounts to an act of war in the background, right? So talk about a negotiating tool. If you could, if you could connect to some patriotic actors within, say, the government of Tehran or the government uh, in Venezuela or wherever you, that might happen to be, imagine the negotiating tool coming as an agent of the of the United States military or of the United States forces, um, you know, overall, and essentially saying you can cooperate or we can engage this militarily. We all know what you would, you know, prefer to do. So through this process, and I know I'm getting a little bit off track, but through this process, the oil markets are, I think, a major target of this. We have to reshape how energy is conducted. For one, 
zero point energy exists and that's going to enter itself into the public fold over this next i think 10 to 15 year period in a massive massive way so reshaping of these markets will be fundamentally necessary irrespective of what's happening right now in the world the awareness is simply out there that tesla energy is real and we do actually have you know a basic schematic that we can go off of on how to implement capture harness and then utilize that that available energy the other thing is that the worldwide energy markets prop up this petrodollar that we were talking about and make possible the nefarious criminal activity all around the world because as the demand for the dollar uh, stays high in those areas that are not U.S. dollar based, you would think, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about like the crime rings of Southeast Asia, the Mexican cartels, the South American cartels and drug lords. Um, when that particular item is incentivized, then it's desirable and you can accomplish a lot in a paramilitary outside of the law fashion. But if you were to try and say bribe um, a cartel loader at a loading dock or um, a, a gang in Southeast Asia, excuse me, with um, in you know Indian rupees or uh, Mexican pesos, you would probably receive a much more resistant um, uh, commitment, right? Because that's not as valuable to them in their circles where they're at in the cultural you know life that they're living. <clears throat> excuse me. So the oil situation is going to affect finance and the finance situation affects everything, right? Well, who is responsible for the largest shorts in the world against precious metals? That's Bank of America. Who's responsible for some of the largest um, um, financial fraud and human trafficking uh, that has been recorded in the last hundred years? Well, that's JP Morgan Chase, right? Very, very large financial institutions. So when you turn off their ability to continue the blood flow, and that's really what the oil markets amount to through their participation in holding the assets that are managed by these massive, massive hedge funds you turn off the ability of the hydra to stop the bleeding that's what we want as we the people um but at the same time it is a risky razor's edge to walk because we have to sort of bring this beast down while we're standing in our living room with it well said once again okay so that dovetailed nicely sg into another subject i wanted to kind of discuss with you <clears throat> just kind of finishing up a, a, a sort of a cursory touch up on the financial side so you have uh, the BRICS continuing to stack countries, you know, Iran's involved, e Egypt, as you said, is, is an integral player. I think there's 40 other nations waiting on deck, one of which excites me the most is Zimbabwe for their vast gold and other precious metal reserves, rhodium and the like. And then you have <clears throat> Serbia, who I believe is on deck as well. Uh, you just had uh, Hungary's uh, Viktor Orban kind of sort of give a uh, a very praiseworthy message about President Trump. And I think President Trump is using some of these foreign leaders to kind of tout his message out there on his behalf as he optically returns. So I guess the two-part question here is, you know, how do you see in the next four to six months, we'll say conservatively, how do you see the BRICS and obviously, and we know they're going to extenuate out further on and in, in, as the year and next year comes along and even beyond that. But in the next short term, four to six months, how do you see BRICS playing an integral role in helping to de-dollarize and change the financial landscape of the world that you alluded to? And do you kind of see President Trump working with these other leaders to kind of galvanize these countries? Because you can see France and Spain and Ireland, all the farmers are standing up and they're not having it anymore. The, the people are finally revolting. So how do you see that sort of playing out? Well, quite frankly, I think the two of them are eventually going to coalesce and flesh and flesh themselves out as the means by which we prevent some sort of descent into worldwide chaos. Um, you know, I make no, no no bones about the fact that I look at this entire past seven to eight year period as a massive coordinated operation happening at very, very high levels of military command around the world alongside patriotic actors and governments to disempower a mafia that has manipulated every government on earth for more than a thousand years. And I know that's a dramatic backdrop, but it is important to understand where I'm coming from if we're going to talk about where we're going as it pertains to President Trump. I believe a lot of this was actually put into place by President Trump and sort of the idea floated to the rest of these nations to form an alliance um, to take out these various, you know, multinational globalist entities specifically that operate alongside, uh, alongside with or at the behest of the United Nations, uh, but also that in a way that would allow each culture and every actor and every nation state to administer some level of justice for the wrongs that have been wrought upon their people and upon their land and upon their ancestry and history by this same mafia that we just talked about a second ago. So President Trump, 
if we remember in 2018, gave a press conference alongside Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan, where he came out and said that as it pertained to the land of currency, specifically currency manipulation and, and foreign exchange and trade, we would all be on a, quote, level playing field very soon, end quote. So I believe that this reset financially is is the key that is coming along in this process, which will prevent a true totalitarian power grab from any sort of real success, you know, long term around the world. You know, if you take the lifeblood out of the system, the lifeblood being the ability to manipulate and, and the ability to govern value exchange, and you put into its place something that is, uh, at the very least, much, much more difficult to, to corrupt and manipulate it certainly would not be worth the effort to attempt to do so, but also provides security, benefit, commerce, trade, and and the preservation of value exchange for the for the we the people of the world. Then that's the way I think that you circumvent uh, any sort of victorious move that the Hydra, what remains of that deep state Hydra, could make. Now the BRICS nations, I think, played directly into this, and I think President Trump had discussions with China and Russia specifically about how the financial arrangements and the economic arrangements really needed to look as we moved into this next phase in this next new world, right? A significant amount of our economy, for example, is locked up in the Chinese mainland. A significant amount of um, the Russian government's assets as of three years ago were tied up in U.S. finance markets and were subject to the SWIFT system, right? The Russians did sort of play it close to the close to the goalpost, if you will, with their move on Ukraine and their simultaneous transition away from SWIFT. It was an expertly maneuvered uh, situation that has produced an economic boom within their country and their people and their standard of living has skyrocketed as a result from it. But they were one of the largest and one of the first to truly publicly disconnect and say, you know, no more, we're not going to do this. So the BRICS nations have been trial trial running, essentially, the beta test, if you will, for a new way of value exchange, a new way of conducting commerce, which translates to diplomacy, which translates to laws governing financial exchange and regulation across boundary lines, a new way of giving accountability and value for one's assets from one table to the other coming across those border lines, right? And we're witnessing the um, movement of that particular system to a digitized or quantum uh, situation with the institution of various financial standards, such as Basel III, and I think it was ISO 20022 that came out and have gone into effect, I think, within the last 90 days. So as we look at what's coming, the BRICS nations are trial running what will eventually come, I believe, to the United States markets. But because of the nature of the infection around the rest of the world, right, we have to look at where the effect, infection originated. The origination point was the North American financial markets at the behest of Western European bankers and the Washington, D.C. aid arm and the Washington, D.C. you know military arm of power has exported that model to the rest of the world. So once we get that model removed from the rest yeah. of the world, as Egypt just did today, we're going to see a situation where eventually the model is so heavy under its own bloated weight that it cannot stand even here at home. And you will see a system change of some sort. Again, I'm not a financial advisor but a system change, uh, some sort of reorientation of our financial structures here at home out of necessity for preservation of our society. At that point, I think you're going to see even the most gas-lit liberal come out and say that they want Trump because of his ability to manage finance and run a business. And at the end of the day, the American people, amazing people, I'm so proud to be a part of them, but we are a little bit obstinate until something affects our wallet. And as we move forward and we appreciate that, we can perhaps appreciate how a grander chorus is developing around the rest of the world, and we are going to have our invitation to that chorus in short order. Yeah, absolutely. So well said, History. You, you hit so many touch points on that one conversation piece. <clears throat> I recently had an interview about a week and a half ago with Bill Holter, who's um, well known like yourself in, in his circle. And I asked him when, you know, did he see a specific country playing a role as the financial downfall? And his, he had an interesting take, which is to say that he doesn't think he's watching China, right? He's like, who's going to blink us or them? like you said earlier about, about China and, and the role they play in this instrumentally. But his contention is that basically it's going to be a three-day domino effect that, you know, someone's going to read their 401k or their pension statement, whatever, and say, well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. I've got mine to your point of obstinacy. And then on a Monday, not be able to get in the banks, everything will be flushed out and completely eviscerated. So, it's really good that you kind of touched on that and and kind of how that 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 all plays into this. We talked about this issue, SG, the next 
uh, question for you last month, uh, but it's kind of gone dark. And I was very curious to see what your take on this was in respect to, uh, with respect to the China-Taiwan conflict uh, that we know is being used for a number of different purposes, one of which I believe is to free up Vietnam enough out of communism to free up their Vietnamese dong currency, which plays prominently in this, as you know, they've been part of the WTO since 2004. So they're no strangers to that market. But um, what do you see as far as uh, the China-Taiwan conflict? What's the latest you're hearing? Um, how do we see that playing a role in connection to China, Israel, and the other you know countries that we discussed earlier? Well, you know, it's very interesting that you would bring that up because we're starting to see the essences, the hints of movement on that issue, um, breaking themselves out even to the public fold. You know, and I think that circumvents the level of military information clampdown that's happening in the Pacific region. Um, you just can't stop the spread of information, you know, and in some, you know, in some circumstances. You know, just recently, I think it was today that the Chinese Navy seized a Taiwanese vessel as that vessel was um, attempting to transit itself out of Taiwanese waterways very close to the island. The Chinese asserted jurisdiction. They had military firepower, and we all know what happened as a result of that. Um, I'll have to investigate it and see what the main reason for the seizure was. This is always, you know, a message within the message situation exists around the world right now. But that would suggest to me that we have an unofficial blockade that has already occurred. Um, vessels are not being allowed to leave the Taiwanese island. The U.S. Navy has been very active in the region running sorties. They recently ran an air mission over the South China Sea, um, which is sort of kind of you know flipping the Chinese off in some regards. And so we're seeing this situation get a little bit volatile in some, in some regards. But you know the blockade of Taiwan has to occur before military action. Um, specifically because you've got a number of submarine assets that can leave that island carrying all sorts of who knows what, and without the ability to survey, you know, to survey and track several hundred thousand square miles of ocean all at the same time, which is what is now being, I think, coalesced and congealed in that area, you would run the risk of some of these actors getting away. Um, I believe that the the nature of the diplomatic, you know, reemergence with, or excuse me, um, reunification with uh, Taiwan and, and the Chinese mainland, had, I believe that the, the details of that have already been fleshed out. Uh, we saw a couple of U.S. delegations actually head to Taiwan almost immediately after President Trump in September of 2022 said in a speech in Pennsylvania that China with Taiwan would be next, referencing Russia and Ukraine. That was the first time that President Trump had publicly stated that China would move on Taiwan even though patriots and Anons have known for the last couple of years that if the biological terrorism conducted at several Taiwanese institutes is true, we have to have some sort of military campaign in there to neutralize some of that. And those, those and of course, those biological terrorism institutes working very closely alongside with the AI-driven transhumanistic agenda because Taiwan is the world's largest producer of semiconductor chips. So, you know, tying all of this back together, we're seeing movement now. We're beginning to see transition uh, of of uh, Chinese assets across that South China Sea. Um, you know, through these various news reports that are coming out, we've seen I've seen several Twitter feeds tracking the the activity of Chinese aircraft, and they have literally buzzed the island, um, which tells me that the Taiwanese air defenses, at the very least, are not being engaged, and perhaps may not be um, very sufficient. That that could be a chicken situation. You know, us or them, who's going to shoot first? But that would tell me that the Chinese are very, very emboldened by what's happening, and they're not expecting any serious uh, resistance, at least from uh, the Taiwanese in that situation, that would cause difficulty in the campaign. The wild card, I think, John, with all of this is North Korea and Kim. We've got President Trump that has highlighted Kim's ability to certainly command an audience, but also that he has very capable strategic missiles. Uh, these delivery platforms are capable of carrying a nuclear warhead, and they can, you know, they're very accurate and they can target uh, very large areas. And they're currently running live fire drills and have for the last two weeks into the North Korean, um, I think it's the Pyong, Pyongyang Sea. Um, pardon my pronunciation on the geography there. It's off to the southwest of the country. You know, they've been shooting these missiles out and literally dropping them right into the ocean, I think, as they um, putting their feathers up, or putting their fan up for some sort of event. I wish that I understood more about how these events could play themselves out. There's just so many directions that it could go. You could have some sort of Chinese missile used against a U.S. asset. You could have a North Korean uh, misfire, a claimed misfire that would set off a shooting mission. 
Um, the South Korean, you know, North Korean situation, I think you're going to see the 38th parallel dissolved in this process and some sort of single form government or some sort of reunification of the Korean peninsula is very likely to occur. Um, you know, so in this process, John, there's so many different directions that the Pacific theater could take. It really is the key. It really is, I think, the linchpin to a great deal of what's happening because a military campaign in the Pacific would activate uh, Article 5 of NATO, because we know the U.S. Navy assets are in that area and they would be caught in the crossfire, would NATO be able to respond? The same fashion or the same type of situation would happen if Turkey moved uh, uh, you know, on the Israeli countryside and we, we can sort of really see that set up coming. The Turkish Army and the Air Force, or excuse me, the Turkish Air Force has been running cross-border operation missions into Syria and Iraq since January 1st. So all of this, I think, is balancing a very, very large worldwide seesaw, if you will, with multiple seats across different, you know, balance checkpoints and fulcrums. And whichever one falls first is going to cause a cascade effect. How this looks and how this, you know, collapses in the Pacific theater to reshape world financial markets and, quite frankly, to eliminate some biological terrorism activities that have occurred. That's the real question. Indeed. Uh, last question for today, SG, because uh, I know you got a lot to do and, and we'll pick this up on our next uh, podcast. But um, there's been a lot of back and forth discussion I've noticed uh, amongst many patriots, not all, but amongst many in regards to the election cycle this year here in the U.S. Some believe that we're going to have an election with paper ballots and military standby. Some believe we're not going to have that as, as a, a response to or as a result of Nessera. Uh, so I would just like to get your informed take on how you see this uh, playing out. Well, I mean, quite frankly, I think that the election of 2024, uh, should it uh, should some sort of ballot casting actually occur on November the 5th, I don't believe it's going to occur under the same auspices that it's always occurred, you know, traditionally before. Um, personally, and, and this is just speculation, I think that you're going to see some sort of National Guard administered. Uh, ballot process or, or selection process where individuals go and they cast a vote. It's counted by hand. Um, there's no fraud involved. There's a chain of custody clearly demonstrated with transparency and, and everybody's got a smartphone and a video camera these days. And we'll have the ability to move into a lawful period of civilian government where we can then take the lawful authorities of the government and put them to the deep state apparatus once and for all. Along that process to arrive at that hypothetical, and that is a hypothetical, I think that we're going to see the Biden administration or the Manchurian administration, provided that they exit Joe Biden in, in an attempt to you know, maintain damage control. I think that you're going to see that administration cancel or suspend the electoral process here in the United States due to some sort of national crisis or critical national emergency. Um, how that looks, I think, could go a number of different ways, but will almost certainly involve the southern border. President Trump recently has said that there is a 100 percent chance of a terrorist attack here in the United States of America. Well, what does terrorist attack mean? The CIA is the largest terrorist group on Earth. So when we when we read into that, what are we talking about with a terrorist attack? Are we talking about a coordinated event at the behest of the intelligence community? That would certainly fit the playbook of irregular warfare that's been waged against we, the people in all nation states for a very long time. Right. And is the nature really of the broader war, the broader conflict that's happening around the rest of the world, this sleight of hand reactivity war um, that has allowed a great deal of things to occur because it destroys the system that has allowed the great deal of things to occur. I know that that sounds a little bit circular, but it is, you know, if we stop and, and, and examine, that is actually how many of these things have played out. So. In this process, you're going to see something happen here stateside, regardless of what that is, and there is going to be some sort of emergency invoked, I believe, by the Manchurian administration to interfere with that electoral process, because it will be the only option left, right? We've now gone the judicial route. We're seeing um, uh, the, the, you know, ostensibly the former president being ostracized you know, in public and, and being targeted by the weaponized judiciary, they're seeking to throw him, you know, publicly in jail. And if we assume for a moment that he is the lawful commander in chief of, of the United States military, I think we have to appreciate that component forces of that military are not going to allow the lawful incarnation of the of the civilian government of the United States of America to be put into political prison. So we must then we must then look at what the time frame is, and the time frame would be about mid summers to late summers before they, some sort of movement would have to occur on this issue. President Trump will be the next president of the United States. The issue here is that along in that process, I think you're going to see a Manchurian 
uh, installation um, flesh out a military dictatorship from the shadows. You know, last time we were on air, I think I misquoted the executive order number. It was 13224 from the 43rd president of the United States of America on 92301. And, we, and that, that order put the United States into a military dictatorship in the background. A significant portion of the Bill of Rights was suspended under wartime national emergency, and the authority to do so was derived from the 1973 War Powers Act. The War Powers Act codified into U.S. code the ability of the president to circumvent the constitutional stipulation that Congress be the one entity, the one and only entity to declare and make war. And so the president, as CIC, was empowered under this act to circumvent that and unilaterally declare war under emergency conditions. And that's exactly what we had on 9 11 one so a similar style setup, whether it is a 9-11 event, whether it is a threat for a 9-11 style event, whether it is a major national security issue that causes uh, pausing of civil society, regardless of what it may be, I think we're going to see the fulfillment of that military dictatorship out into the foreground. And I think you're going to see cause for the United States military to get involved domestically to protect the republic. Moving towards that period, uh, moving towards that November season, I think that that cause will have to occur with enough time to reconstitute things, and that will take more than just a couple of weeks, right? We could we could potentially look at 30 to 40 days of some sort of interim government, some sort of cooperation between the last known lawful representatives of the peoples of the United States really moving into the 2020 election season excuse me, um, and some sort of military emergency um, administrative setup that has taken charge of various areas of the country to prevent total collapse. Um, you know, and again, we and you know, John, this this is against the background of financial uh, background of financial uh, collapse, market collapse, biological terrorism, reattempts, right? The pandemic treaty, there's so much mm -hmm. going on. They're clearly setting up 2024 to be a Hail Mary event. So, you know, yep. all of that to say, do I think that there's going to be an election? Yes, we will have to arrive at some sort of an election position in this process. It's the only way to move the power structures in the world back to we the people in a lawful, spiritually aligned fashion. But that election does not have to be administered through machines, through local precincts. For all we know here in the United States, it could be administered by the military at a community level because some sort of invasion within our own institutions has occurred that threatens the very existence of our republic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Thank you for the, the detailed anal analysis on that. Excuse me. <clears throat> so SG, uh, as we close out, I'm going to say my last word to my audience here, but I'm going to give you the floor first. And uh, any last thoughts and, and sentiments that you'd like to share with our audiences and your audience, respectively? I, I mean, my last message would be that we've talked a lot about things that seem certainly intimidating, certainly foreboding, um, a little bit scary, quite frankly. But when we appreciate that the bad things are now happening to them that the, the system of control is now crumbling right in front of their eyes, that they, that, that just like sand slipping through their fingers, their control over we, the people, especially in the consciousness and, and narrative space is evaporating and just falling away. There is cause for joy in all of this, because at the end of the day, if we look at the population numbers, there's 8 billion of us, and there's about 500 but thousand to a million of them worldwide in total. Uh, the numbers really are in our favor. And I think that considering that we're in, you know, this is year 16 of the 16 year plan to destroy America, and we're all still having this conversation and things seem to be relatively okay. I would say that we're in good hands. President Trump tells us that we're going to make America great again. And he's incredibly confident and sort of beaming with uh, his own cleverness at these rallies sometimes. So I really do think that there are just things the CIC knows that he cannot tell us. He will never tell us. It will never go on public record. Um, but it has essentially helped, you know, reflip the balance of power in the world back to we the people. So stay the course. You know, at the end of the day, we win. And so does God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. And folks, you heard SG, he's <clears throat> talked about be the people, the patriot community, and you're here because you want the truth, you want information, and you want it at the highest possible co level of cogency. So you felt ostracized and maybe felt, uh, you know, that it was hard for you to connect with like-minded patriots out there, especially when there's all this uh, intentional division created within the ranks of our family and as just a societal construct. We understand that, which is one of the reasons that we have this channel. And what we're doing is creating 
right now a private sub-channel uh, called www.therealworldac.com. And we're excited about it because our team is putting together uh, a list of, of specialty folks, such as people like SG at some point, and uh, Nick Benyam and myself and others, where you'll have direct access point with us on live chats, uh, break down very detailed analysis of various subject matters as it relates to financial, geopolitical, what have you. You'll also be able to connect with other like-minded patriots in your neighborhood, in your region, and throughout the country, and also business uh, executives, world leaders, if maybe you have an, a product or an idea or a product for an idea for a product, or maybe you want to create a channel partnership of some type, this is a great channel and a resource to do that. So do please do check out www.realworldac.com. SG and on, thanks for joining us uh, once again. We appreciate it. We look forward to having you on shortly. Thank you, my friend. Good to be here. I look forward to coming back. God Likewise. bless everyone. God bless.